Thank you. Please be seated. So right now, during this pandemic, more so than ever, we're seeing selfishness, right? People are locking themselves up um, to, to holding on to their lives more than ever before. Um, there's a lot of... And, and almost like greed, selfishness is coming out into play when you go to grocery stores. You don't see any toilet paper, you don't see paper towels, you don't see beans, you don't see rice. Amongst all of this hoarding, greeting, what we're forgetting about is there's people who have nowhere to quarantine. Um, they're on the streets, they're, they're the forgotten ones, they're the ones we overlook. And it's difficult because not only do they have not nowhere to go, a lot of the shelters have closed down. All the community resources that they need are shut down. The parks, the soup kitchens, the the where they the public restrooms where they, they, they showered, washed. They have no restrooms right now, they have no showers, they have no running water. Um, so it's difficult. June 2018, we started off going to a homeless shelter once a week and visiting, uh, spending time with them, but not just um, behind the counter serving food. We went from behind the counter to the table, sitting with them, eating with them, interacting with them, um, building relationships. And then we started going to church with them in San Bernardino. Um, and then we started a block party. So it went from one day a week to seven days a week. Uh, and then the pandemic hit, and so it wiped it all out. Uh, for about a week, we're like, oh man, you know, what can we do? You know, we can't see them. Um, but many of them were texting, calling, hey, Bo, um, uh, we need, you know, we don't have food. We don't, a lot of the churches shut down, the community resources shut down. And especially during this pandemic, one of the big um, comments I hear is, hey, you need to be staying home at this time. You know, why are you guys going out? You know, you, know, you guys are trying to be rebellious. And it's different because, when people say stay home, they say stay home to, to spread, stop the, the spread, right, of COVID-19. But um, when people say stay home, it, they say stay home with your families, right? But I think when you spend time with people, um, the more you love someone, the more time increases as well, right? It's relational. Love and time is connected. And you guys want us to pray for anything? Pray for anybody. I understand not going out to help homeless people, but what about if they're your brothers and your sisters, right? The people that you've spent the last year, last two years with. Now it's not a homeless person. Now it's it's my brother, Mike. It's my it's my sister, Ryder. So when they call me and ask me for food, I think anyone who's at home right now, it's like, hey, you know, mom, dad, brother, sister, come bring me food. You'll go to Scum LA. Darlene, we got food! Boom! <laughs> we got these ninja masks, so we need to know some ninja. Masks. Probably one of the most powerful moments we had were we were on E Street and we pulled over, we gave them burritos, and one of the men commented, Man, we're so sad, you know, church is closed, the, the block party's closed, Vespers, no church, you know, but, but we're thankful that you brought church to us, you know. So church is not always just a, a brick and mortar building, you know. It, it's all I think the people make the church, right? So, you know, when one or two are gathered, you can worship, you can pray, you know, you can break bread together. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we might be opening back up on May, May 14th, okay. right? So then you can wear this to church, Stephen. Yeah. Maybe. She said tentatively. We'll tentatively. <laughs> um, we just wish that everyone can get through this virus soon, that we may come back to the church, join our friends and worship. If you sing faith, amen. When Jesus was here, right, his ministry, he was in the streets, you know, he was with the, the, the marginalized, the prostitutes, the outcasts, and he spent the time 
not not just talking to them, but eating with them, right? Eating with them, building relationships. And he won over so many people like that. So even today in this pandemic, there's a time and a place for that too. There's a time and place to eat with people, to break bread together, to pray together, to meet up. Um, and so we're not trying to be rebellious. You know, this is what we're convicted to do, to do because, you know, Jesus did it. Happy Sabbath, you guys. We're so glad to be here. I'm from uh, Loma Linda, California, and currently all the churches there are closed down, and so praise the Lord, we can be indoors uh, on a Sabbath, and I really appreciate this opportunity to be, join you guys this Sabbath. Thank you guys so much. My name is Bo Kim. I'm from Loma Linda University. I'm the homeless ministry director. And uh, what we do is we go out seven days a week and we hang out with our brothers and sisters in, in the street, build relationships with them. And um, I have a story I wanted to share with you. If you guys have Instagram, uh, we are, our um, handle is fusion underscore San Bernardino. And if you open it up, there's a picture of a gentleman and his name is Anthony Baca. And this way it looks like, I know you probably can't see it from where you're at, but this individual was um, homeless. He was on the streets and uh, he said, quote unquote, I hate when churches come visit me because they would just drop off food and then say, God bless you and keep walking. They didn't even see me, right? And he said, or they would try to hand me um, a pamphlet or a book, but they didn't know me. They didn't care about my name. They didn't care to know um, about me at all. That was a feeling that I received. Um, and one of our friends, his name is Genesis, would stop by once a week, share a burrito with him and just talk to him, just as a friend. Over the course of time, he started asking about prayer, Bible studies, and got baptized. Um, after that, uh, currently, he, he's teaching at Souls West. Um, there's a Bible college, an Adventist Bible college in Prescott, and he's one of the, he's an evangelist, he preaches, and next year, in the next summer, he starts medical school at Loma University. And so this is the power of relationships. So um, three lessons I learned from this. Number one, God doesn't call the qualified, right? God qualifies the called, right? If you're willing to go, God will, God will provide. Um, whether it be words, whether it be provisions, God will always supply the needs. Even if you don't feel, hey, I'm just an average person. I don't have the, the, the special skills to preach like Pastor John or, or, or sing like our, our brother Mark who's just up here. God will provide everything that you need to witness to everyone else. We are the church. Uh, and lesson number two that I learned is who we are yesterday doesn't have to be who we are tomorrow. So when you guys walk by some of the streets today, just because they're homeless today doesn't mean they have to be homeless tomorrow. And we can contribute to the difference tomorrow, right? And lesson three is uh, one thing that I think was so powerful about what um, Mr. Anthony Baca um, told me is information without relationship is intimidation. So if we're going out there and we don't care about the individual and it's just a, a, a glow track, a, a book or food, we're just intimidating them, right? It's like, man, you don't really see me. That might not be what I need. Maybe all I need today is a bottle of water, a Band-Aid, right? So I hope today that when we go out in the streets that we picture everyone as Christ or as Mr. Anthony Baca, a future doctor at Loma University, and say, hey, what is my, my name's Joe, what is yours? I would love to get to know you, right? Um, and I know currently at this church, Sister Belinda, I don't know where she is right now, she's right here, and uh, Sister Belinda, her sister Pat, and Pat's daughter, Melissa, they go out every other Sunday to Phoenix, and they bring 100 meals with them, and, and they build relationships and, and friendships with our brothers and sisters on the street in Phoenix. If you'd like to join them, I would love for you to, to contact Sister Belinda, and if you'd like to volunteer, donate financially, or right now they're currently looking for winter supplies, um, you could reach out to her and connect, and we would love to see you guys. We're going to be in the Phoenix area today. We're going out for outreach, and then tomorrow as well at 9 o'clock. If you guys are interested in contributing or joining, please contact Sister Bun, and thank you for this opportunity to share with you guys. Happy Sabbath. Thank you so much, Bo. Uh, what an encouraging ministry. Amen? Wasn't hard. Pulled up Instagram, found you, and followed you. So I'm with you. And uh, I did have a chance here recently to spend uh, a Sunday morning out there with Belinda and her sister and daughter and a few others that were there participating. And I'll tell you what, 
Uh, the people that are coming over, yes, they're getting a breakfast burrito, and yes, they're getting maybe some, some uh, other food to take with them, and they're getting maybe some uh, literature as well that we give out, and some clothing and things, but what I was seeing were people that were connecting. They had seen him before, they'd say, hey, it's good to see you again, glad you're back. This is, these are the relationships we need to be building. And uh, more than ever right now, uh, those that do not have homes, that are living in tents, that are on the street, they need our help. So I encourage you, if we stagger this and all of us go out there and participate from time to time, every other Sunday morning, they'll have more than enough people. And if you'd like to donate, please talk to Belinda uh, because she'll give you exactly the list of the things that they're needing right now. You know what, it, it, is, a, it is very ironic that we are transitioning from talking about that to talking about this blessing in front of us. Because this is the food that you brought for families in Phoenix that would not have a Thanksgiving meal except that you did participate, you did bring. And so I thank you for your, your gifts. Uh, these gifts we know come because God has blessed us, right? And because God has blessed us, we should be liberal with our giving to others. And so you have done that. You've also given financial gifts. And I know that um, the Lonies, uh, Megan is leading out with this, but also Ed and uh, Bonnie, they are all working to pull these baskets together and to get them to people that need them. So thank you so much for that. I am here to pray over these baskets. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me as we ask the Lord to bless through this giving. Father in heaven, Lord, you have given us so much. We can't even count your blessings. But sometimes, Lord, I just pray for forgiveness because I hold back in what I give. Father, we're trying our best not to hold back any longer. And these gifts here, they're for families who need a blessing from you this Thanksgiving. And so we thank you for using us to bring that blessing here. We pray that you would grow it, that you would touch the lives of those who receive it, that they will see that this is coming from your hand. There's nothing that we offer that we bring to the table of ourselves, but accept that we respond because you said give. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So Lord, we ask, please, Lord, bless your people through these gifts and thank you for the blessing to us that we may also give toward this cause. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And I want to say just maybe uh, up front here, if you have a few moments out afterward um, to come down and to help, we need to cart these, uh, uh, all the, the food and things here up to the education wing. I believe it's room, oh, it's in the rotunda, I'm sorry. We're going to cart this over to the rotunda. If you could grab a box or, or a bag or something and just bring it over there, that would be fantastic. We appreciate your help. Thank you very much. and the ones here and the ones at home. Start over. Okay, it's time for the children's story. I want every child to pay attention both here and at home. Whoever is watching, pay attention. Sorry, whoever is watching, pay attention. My story is going to be very short. A long, long time ago, there used to be um, a very rich man and a very, very poor man. The poor man used to live around the rich man's house. And the rich man, as he drives by, they used to say hi. Time passed on, and very soon, they got to know each other very well, and they became friends. The rich man got very sick, and so many times he made many trips to the hospital. And the poor man could not get anything because the rich man is the one who used to give him food or clothes, but now he's getting sick. Once he got a little bit better, they sat down for a talk. And as they were talking, the rich man said this, you know what, friend, I have everything. I have a house, I have, I, have, I have a family, I have big cars, I have a jet, but I'm not even enjoying any of this. I wish I could just be fine. I wish I could just be healthy. 
And then the poor man said, I, I eat, I eat all the bad food on the streets. I stay in the cold, but I don't fall sick. Somehow I don't fall sick. I have nothing. I, sometimes I don't even know where I'm going to sleep. I don't even know where the next meal is coming from. But I never fall sick. Then they came to a conclusion. Uh-huh. You don't fall sick, but you have nothing. I fall sick many, many times. I don't even enjoy what I have, but I have everything. They came to one conclusion. I am grateful, the rich man said, that I have everything. I'm thankful for everything I have, even though I'm not healthy. And the poor man said, you know what? I don't mind being poor, because if it means having everything, also I'm not healthy, I'm thankful that I am healthy. So they both said thank you to each other, and the rich man accommodated the poor man, he became his driver, he became his servant, so he had a shelter, he had a place to stay, and he, they encouraged each other, he had a friend, and they were all thankful. What do we learn from this lesson? In every situation you find yourself in, any situation, be it you got the coronavirus, be it you have nothing, be it friends have deserted you, children, be it you're not going to school, be it you're doing virtual Zoom that is driving you nuts, be thankful for that. Because at least we have the internet, at least you are staying home with mommy to check you out. There are so many things you can be grateful, even parents, I'm grateful. I have appreciated teachers even more. So there's always something we can be thankful in every situation. The Bible says in all things, in everything, be thankful. Since I became a teacher, since the coronavirus, <laughs> I gave my children a simple assignment this week. I told them to write three things they'll be grateful for. So quickly, I'm going to call them forward. I, I don't know what they wrote down. Quickly, I want them to come and read for us. I'm, I want very fast, take off your mask. I don't know what they wrote, so I'm going to hear it too for the first time. And then Paula will pray for us. I am thankful for the air that we breathe in. I am thankful for the health that we don't have any COVID-19. I am thankful for a family. I am thankful for our brothers and sisters. I am thankful for even our parents and teachers. I'm thankful for our church, and I'm thankful for the world that we're living in, and I'm thankful for the God that we worship. Amen. Okay, I saw some spelling mistakes. I'll fix those at home. <laughs> Paula is going to pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for everything you've done, the food that we eat, the clothes that we wear, and the house that we live in. Now to God goes with the blood, Jesus, make us thank you, thankful for um, the people that we, the people that came to listen to church, and the ones that are watching. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. that prayer there is no need for prayer right well I want to be um, honest with you this morning and just tell you what an honor what an honor it is to be in the Lord's house what what a privilege we have like uh, Bo is it is that his name Bo the guy that was here talking about the ministry the homeless ministry uh, talking to people in Riverside how their churches are closed we are privileged to be able to come into the house of the Lord because we live right now in a world that is just so, 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 in, so much in chaos. So let's pray and let's give God the thanks this morning and give him the glory. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so very much for your undeserving love. We want to thank you for the care that you have had with each and every one of us. Thank you, Father. We should stop and think and make a list of all the things that you have provided for us, all the things that we should be thankful for so that we could forget our problems and stop complaining. We ask, oh, Father in heaven, that you give us a special gift today. We ask for the anointment, the endowment of the Holy Spirit, how we need your Holy Spirit. Help us, oh Father, this morning to have an attitude of gratitude and to have a spirit of forgiving, of forgiving, of, uh, forgiving 
others, Father, forgiving ourselves. Sometimes we hold on to things. We don't forgive ourselves. Forgive those, Father, that we hold grudges against. And Father, we ask also this morning, we want to feel your presence. Please be with the speaker of today. Please be with Pastor John. Anoint his lips and allow him, Father, to speak the words that you have put in his heart, a message special for us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Uh, happy Sabbath. Um, I struggled with a little bit with what I was going to say today. Call it an offering. I think we'll rename it uh, Gratitude in Greenbacks. Um, you know, it's really easy. I think at just uh, seeing all of this up here, you know, I think the more grateful we are, the more that we give. And I think particularly this year, um, the struggle is not necessarily to know that the more grateful you are, the more you give, but to see really how much you have to be grateful for. Um, our gratitude probably doesn't go as deep as it should. And so I think that once we, um, you know, once we're able to really be more grateful, our giving will flow from that. Um, the giving today is for Camelback Church Ministries. You have evidence right in front of you of what that's all about. And I think that will truly hit our peak when we're able to take our gratitude and weaponize it and really realize what we're supposed to be grateful for. Hit some words that I just looked up. I was uh, struggling this morning, like I said, and so I think that God kind of led me to Google. There's some words from a gentleman named uh, Herbert Miller. He's a disciple teacher and a church leader. And he said, the primary aim of stewardship development is not to finance the church annual operating budget, but to change lives. Tithing changes lives period. Tithing is the essence, the heart, the crux of God's economics. We are talking about money, yes, yet we are also really talking about the miracle of human transformation. Tithing and giving generously in grateful response to God's grace is not something we think about just as the offering plate is about to be passed. Tithing is a positive way of life. Good morning, church. Our scripture this morning is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God.
One of the problems with these masks, you go to take them off and they stick to your technology. Thank you so much, Riley, for that wonderful song. Very beautiful. I can see you're not only learning your crossover dribble, you're learning your crossover hands for the piano. Very good. We have a thing because we love basketball, so... Well, it's good to be with you here uh, today. It seems like it's been several weeks since I've been in the pulpit. Uh, of course, we've had some wonderful things. My friend John Lomacang being here last Sabbath. That was a blessing. Amen. We're, we're trying to find a way to continue on with this house calls thing, but it's hard to do from a distance. You know, he's in Illinois. I'm here in Phoenix, but the Lord's going to work something out. We're confident in that. Uh, Would you bow your heads with me before we jump in to the message today? Father in heaven, Lord, this is a high Sabbath. A high Sabbath because 
We bring our thanks to you. And what better way to cap it off than with a communion service where we partake of the emblems that point to your death in our behalf. Lord, as we open our hearts to you, speak to us. Give us a deeper meaning of what you accomplished for us on the cross. Because with that, we know that we can bear a testimony of what not only have you done for us in our lives, but what you offer the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. How does Jesus lifted up on the cross draw everyone to himself? Well, Paul dives into this and I think tells us the answer, at least some of the answer, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. One of my favorite verses to use to preach on in the Bible, actually. He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message, let me shorten it. The message of the cross is the power of God for those who are saved or are being saved. So Jesus being lifted up and understanding the message of what he was doing there brings power to save us. And without that power... All we have is this mental ascent acknowledgement that, yeah, Jesus died for me and I'm going to follow him, but there's no depth. In our culture today, we must go beyond the standard answer for why we are Christians. The answer, Jesus, because Jesus died for me, leaves many things unanswered in the secular mind. It is, and in many respects always has been, insufficient for sharing why you have committed your life to follow Jesus. Why why do you believe in Jesus? Why do you follow him? Because he died for me. Now, that's part of the answer. It's a big part of the answer, but what do you mean by that? You see, the meaning is lost sometimes in that quick, pat answer. If we fail to understand the message of the cross, the deeper meaning of why Jesus hung there, then our belief in Christ will be shallow and lack a motivational power to sustain us in our walk with him. In fact, when your belief is challenged, and it will be someday, you had to have gone deeper than Jesus died for me. I agree it's the answer, but what do you mean by that? I love this quote from A Desire of Ages, page 83. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. She's talking about the cross. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant. Notice this. As we're dwelling on, what was he doing there? And we read and we study and and we, we take that in. Our confidence in him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. Without understanding the message of the cross, we lose power. So today I want to talk about what Jesus was doing there. 
And it was, it's, it's not everything that Jesus was doing. There, there are so many angles, so many things Jesus was accomplishing as our Messiah. But it certainly, hope, I hope it will be, it will bring a deeper meaning to your life and your commitment to him. At the end of the movie Titanic, I don't know, this was out many, many years ago. Um, I haven't seen it in ages. Uh, don't endorse or support the movie or anything. I just remember it being big. And especially this last scene was impactful for young people that saw it. So that I remember. But I had to look up on Wikipedia and the plot and to see what happened at the end. <laughs> so don't go out there and just watch the movie or anything, but I just want to tell you what happens at the end. So the Titanic goes down, right? We all know that story. These two... Got, they got far enough away from the Titanic and did not get pulled down with the pull of the water as it sunk down into the, to the bottom of the ocean. And as the two characters are Jack and Rose, so as they go and they find this piece of paneling from the ship that will sustain only one of them, Jack tells Rose, you get up there, you stay up there, I will stay here because if I get up with you, we'll sink. But I'll hang on. She falls asleep. He falls into hypothermia. And you see one of the last scenes is he's sinking into the water and he dies. He allowed her to live, but in turn died to save her. Now, I will admit this story is hardly a perfect example of what Jesus did for us on the cross, did for all mankind. It's far too simplistic. There is more going on on the cross than one person giving a life for another. In fact, if you think about it, no court with true justice in mind would allow for that. I mean, can you imagine a son on death row appearing for his sentencing, or actually he, he appears for his sentencing and he may go to death row, he may be sentenced to death, and the mother standing up in the courtroom saying, Judge, um, I'd like to take the, the place of my son. You know, put me on death row and kill me and let my son go. What's the court, what's the answer going to be? No, of course not. That would not be fair. Well, it's, it's a similar thing with Jesus. There's something about what Jesus did that goes beyond one life exchanged for another. Although, in every sense, he was on the cross dying for you. So how does Jesus' death allow us to live? How does he have the right to justify sinners who stand guilty and undeserving of eternal life? Well, the Bible tells us, the Bible does tell us these answers. But I will say it tells those who are willing to listen. Let me talk about this for just a minute. There are some in the world that do not want to hear anything about it. Your job is not to convince them that the gospel is true. Your job is to speak to those who are open to the message. Too often we, we spend so much of our time trying to bring someone along to convince someone, to argue with someone about the truths of the gospel and what Jesus has done that we forget, you know what, there are lots of others who are more willing to listen than this person. <laughs> and I'm not being harsh, I'm just saying God asks us to share, Christ wants his disciples to share the gospel with those who will listen. And for those who won't, we don't write them off. We pray for them and we intercede for them. But don't go from one Bible study to the next Bible study to the next Bible study hoping they'll make a decision. Because you know what? Time is short. And there are people there that will listen. With that being said, 2 Corinthians 5.19 says this, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now, here's, here's what I get from this. 
Let's go, let's go to the next slide. Here's what I get from uh, this passage. I think this next one more slide. And then you'll catch up there, CJ. One more. All right. Um, I, I threw a, him for a curve because I have a couple other things that I skipped. What I read from this passage that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself is this. Jesus was not an innocent third party to the infraction. Jesus wasn't outside of our sinning against God. He wasn't standing outside and going, you sinned against God. Okay, now I'm going to step in and I'll die for you. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Adam and Eve from the beginning sinned against their creator. The creator was Jesus. He is the first party of this infraction. He is who we committed sin against. Yet on the cross, he's dying for the sin that was committed against him. Not only that, he's the creator of the world and he's coming, he's spit on, he's hung on this cross and he's willing to stay there to save you and me. Amen. So this isn't the same as some courtroom thing where the infraction is against somebody else and some mom steps up and says, oh, I want to die for my son. No, Jesus is saying this, I will no longer prosecute. Amen. I will pay the price for your sin so that you could have eternal life. In that respect, he died so that you might have life. Amen. Several times the Bible refers to the cross as a tree. As a tree. This is no casual reference but a direct connection to what happened in the Garden of Eden. The authors by inspiration, that is the Bible authors, were giving a not so subtle allusion to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was by eating that tree that Adam and Eve fell into sin and lost the dominion that God had given them over the earth. Through deception, their rule their rule over earth, which was to remain throughout eternity, was usurped by Satan, which left them no hope for relief from condemnation. It was theirs. They deserved that. And we, their ancestors, or their descendants, excuse me, their descendants, deserve the same. That relief from condemnation, condemnation caused them to hide in the garden, right? Right? They hid, they saw they were naked, and they did anything they could to avoid seeing God. But then grace showed up. Grace showed up. God asks, where are you? And he's drawing them to him not to condemn, but to expose, to reveal what happened. And then notice this, before a word of any kind of sign of the consequences of sin even come into play, Jesus doesn't look at them, he turns to who? Satan. And he says to him, I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking of his people, and between your seed and her seed, capitalized, the coming Messiah, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, you will suffer a deadly wound. And not, this one will not rise. It, it will mean your doom. Then he turns to Adam and Eve and he pronounces the consequences of living under the curse of sin. But he doesn't pronounce any kind of condemnation. This is grace at work. And I bet you, I would suggest that this is the opposite of sometimes how you feel when you sin. Because when you sin, the devil's not looking to condemn you. 
He's looking at Satan, reminding him, your time's coming. Because when the devil gets you, he gets one of God's children. On the tree, Jesus paid the penalty for Adam and Eve's rebellion. But he also did something else. Jesus broke Satan's dominion over the world. Adam was the original son of God, right? You read through Luke's um, uh, account of all of the descendants, and I think uh, it starts uh, with the current. It's almost, it's going backward. And when it gets to Adam, it says, and Adam, the son of God. Not the son of someone else, not the son of some human being, but the son of God himself. When Adam and Eve lost dominion of this earth, in one sense, they were no longer, he was no longer the son of God. We are all sons of God by faith in Christ today, but he lost that status, but it wasn't lost forever. Because the son of God would come, the new Adam would come, Jesus Christ, and that's his title, the son of God. So when you think of the son of God, remember, this is referring to the one who took back the world and now rules forever. In the garden, Adam and Eve committed not only an offense that required atonement, they became subjugated under the power of an enemy. They needed deliverance. And this deliverance could only come from the one who created them in the first place. This is when the creator became the savior. Romans 5.15 tells us, for if by one man's offense many died, speaking of the one man Adam, and all of us dying, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to who? To many. On the cross, what Adam and Eve lost by their disobedience was recovered forever by Jesus through obedience. Let me repeat that. On the cross, what Adam and Eve lost by their disobedience was recovered forever by Jesus through obedience, even to the point of death which is exactly what Paul is saying in Philippians 2.8. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of what? Death. Even death of the cross. George Smeaton explains how sin was the ground of Satan's dominion. Sin is the ground of Satan's dominion. It gives him, notice this, the sphere of his power, the strength, the secret of his strength, sin gives Satan strength and power. So when Jesus hung there and he paid the price for our sins and he says, they're no longer credited to you or counted to you, my perfect life is accounted to you. You no longer are under the dominion of Satan. You have been released. We need to live each day like that's a reality. We need, we cannot forget that we have been delivered by what Jesus did for us. The only way to neutralize Satan was by the removal of sin and its power and by stepping in as ruler over the earth. Jesus became the son of man through his death on the cross. He says in John 12, 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Speaking of the cross, uh, the cross event, Jesus is saying, this ruler that's been here, he's not going to be at home any longer. <laughs> this is going to become my home. This is my domain. I'm buying it back. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, honestly, I approach sin differently now than I ever did before. When I fall, at some point, little things, I mean, whether it's anger or, or just 
struggling to be patient, all this stuff. I mean, you start seeing the little sins when you become a follower of Christ for a while. You start seeing the stuff that really needs to be helped. My approach is in those situations, I'm already victorious through Jesus. Why am I focusing on the sin? Let's focus on the victory. Let's focus on the cross. But there's something else that we need to understand about this tree, this tree. Genesis 2 tells us that after God created, created Adam and Eve, that he commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now that was actually after creating Adam. And then Eve comes along. She understands this because she's repeating essentially the same words to the serpent with a slightly different twist. But the point is here that the perfect pair was asked to believe God, to trust what God said. He gave them the freedom to eat thousands of fruit and nut trees, things we don't even we haven't seen or experienced here 6,000 years later. Lots of this stuff is just gone. I mean, imagine you, when we get to heaven, rather than a selection of 100 fruits, and I'm even stretching that, it seems like, because I think Rochelle rotates me every morning through about, what, maybe five or six kinds of fruits. <laughs> imagine having thousands a fruit to pick from. Yet Adam and Eve, or Eve, he, she wanders off, she's honing in on this one tree that she can't eat. And we call God restrictive. God was abundantly liberal in his offering. It was narrow-minded what Eve and then Adam saw. This was not about either. This wasn't about what the tree would do to them. It's more about what the tree stood for. It stood for trust, loyalty, and most important, love. So when Adam and Eve disobeyed and ate from the forbidden tree, they immediately began to suffer from the effects of what the Bible calls the curse. This curse is a negative consequences of separation from God. Sin causes separation. It says in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. It's, I'm not distant. I'm not turning my back on you. Your sins are causing you to feel distant from me. And that's what Adam and Eve began to experience right away. You know, in our own battle against sin, we all have some different ones. If we would think of it in these terms, it might be a little easier to say no. In terms of if I do this, I will damage my relationship with the Lord not because of where he has gone or how he feels about me, but because how I will feel about him. It'll also damage my relationships with other people. Sin is destructive. But Jesus came to break its power. And if you want to see the effects of sin, ultimately what it does today Thousands of years after this fall from Adam and Eve, just read 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. On this list is the headlines of today. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be, and notice this list, will be lovers of themselves. Any of that going on? Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers. I'll tell, let me tell you, I, I like sports. I've played sports all my life. I struggle with watching some professional sports today. Not because I don't enjoy the game. It's because I don't like this. 
it's all about me. Look what I did. That's just proud, boastful. And that is not the character of God. You know, every time I see that, boom, forward. <laughs> I'll watch the game, but I don't like that stuff. Where were we? Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. Turn away. But here's the good news. When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost access to another tree. Come on, hear me. They lost access to another tree. What tree was that? The tree of life. The tree of life. Jesus says in Revelation twenty-two fourteen, 14, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. Amen. Jesus also gave us access again to the tree of life. Because he suffered on that tree, the tree of death, for us. Amen. Jesus did so much. And if you've ever wondered why obedience to the law of God is important, <laughs> wonder no longer. When we keep his commandments, we are doing the opposite of what Adam and Eve did in the garden. We're believing in him. We're trusting in him. His way is the better way. We are showing this trust, loyalty, and love for God. The devil is, isn't he? He's very subtle. You know, he's turned keeping the commandments of God into some legalistic thing. This is the way most denominations see this. So in their minds, Jesus on the cross got rid of the law. That's not what he was doing. He was on the cross because of the law. It requires 100% obedience. I love this uh, little um, skit that comes up on the radio. I've heard it a couple times now. And essentially what, what it, it goes like this. Uh, this person comes up and says, hey, you know, what do I need to do to follow God? Well, you, you, have to, you have to make sure that you live a life that is dedicated to him. Well, no, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how, how, how many points do I need to get? I mean, how, how much do I need to earn to get there? And the guy kind of, humors him and says, you got to have a thousand points. Okay, I can get a thousand points. So, all right. Uh, last week, I fed the homeless. Okay, that's one point. <laughs> oh, you know what? I, I did something really nice for my wife. I bought her flowers. Well, one point. You know what? I, I even gave a testimony at church. Uh, two points. So where are we up to now? Um, that'd be four points. How am I ever going to get there? Well, the answer is this. It's not by earning the points. It's by accepting the points, the test that was already made. Jesus already fulfilled and gave all those points by his own life. So quit trying to do it to get Jesus to love you or to get God to love you. Do it because you love God. And that... Is keeping his commandments. Galatians chapter 3, notice these words, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Jesus became a curse for us so that you didn't have to suffer that curse. And then verse 30, verse 26, just a few verses later, listen to this. For now, for you are all 
sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We are sons of God again. We're not sons of a fallen natured Adam and Eve. We're the sons of God in Christ. But Jesus did one more thing on the cross. Well, maybe not one more. He did a lot of things, but at least in my sermon, there's one more thing. Something that motivates me to follow him. The Bible tells us that God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That you've gone too far from the Lord to accept you, he's already paid for the sin you've committed. And he's ready for you to come with full pardon into his family. And the love that he has for you is so strong, it's the one reason why he didn't come down off that cross. Because the human race, including you, was on his mind, and it kept him there. The cross reveals the depth of God's love for you and for me, and his commitment to you was so strong that not even your worst betrayal could shake his, his commitment to redeem you. God has been faithful to us even when we have not been faithful to him. And I would add this, there is no greater motivation to serving Jesus than understanding his love for you. If you haven't experienced that love, whatever is holding you to follow him, it will be shaken at some point. You've got to enter into a knowledge of God through experience and that love that he offers, that he has for you, you must experience that love before you can then begin to love others as well. Once I knew Rochelle loved me, I was all in. It's all I needed to know. You need to know today that Jesus loves you and go all in. I want to read, do something a little different today to close. I want to read Isaiah chapter 53. And if you would open your Bibles to Isaiah 53 and just follow along with me, whatever translation you have, you'll be able to see and follow where I am. But this is... This is the passage that points to the Messiah's work. This is what the Messiah was going to come and do for the human race. And so it's not a long passage. It's only about, what, 12 verses? But I'm going to read through it, and I'm going to give you a little commentary as we go through it as well, all right? So let me share this with you. Just follow along with me. We'll start with verse 1. Who has believed our report? By the way, that report is the testimony of the gospel of salvation, right? Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness that we will see him, or when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, Jesus wasn't attracting people because he looked good. He attracted people because he was compassionate and loving toward people. He despised, he is, he is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was hid as it were, uh, we hid as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows Yet we esteemed him. In other words, we thought he was stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. I, I, you have to understand, we esteemed that that's what happened to him, but he was doing something different. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. 
all, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, notice this, this is almost the same thing that we just read. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, even though we have turned aside and gone our own way. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. Now, I've got to pause there for one minute. That word cut off is the same thing described in Daniel chapter 9 about the Messiah, the, the prophecy of the Messiah, he will be cut off for others, not for himself, but for others. This word cut off is second death language. This is not first death language. This isn't one person dying for another who would then be later raised unto judgment or raised for appearing at the throne of God. No, this is the last second death judgment. When Jesus was in the Garden of Eden and he cried out to God, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. That word soul, what he was describing there is he was experiencing the, the, the he was experiencing the second death even in the garden before he got to trial. What does that say to you? Jesus was experiencing life forever gone throughout eternity so that you could have life for eternity. He couldn't see through the portals of the tomb where he would be raised again. He experienced a complete cutoff from all of life. So, he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. But he has done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, not the pain it caused him, but it pleased God because what he was doing was our deliverance. That's why it pleased the Lord. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, there's your substitutionary atonement right there. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. He will see what he has done, and he's going to be just more than satisfied. He's going to be overjoyed at the work of Jesus. For by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. There's another reference to the second death, his soul. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. If you wonder why we partake of the emblems in the Lord's Supper, and why we're doing that today, there's no better chapter than this one to read. Jesus did it for us. He did it for you. He did it for me. The message of the cross is the greatest story ever told. And it's time, I believe, that we learn it better than Jesus died for me. Let's explain the story. Let's testify as to what God has done. Let's get into our Bibles. Let's learn what Jesus has done for us. Because I know that when you do, when you get into the Word and you find out all this, the, the depth, the riches of the grace of God and His atonement for us, you will remain steadfast. There, as Peter declared, where else are we going to go, Lord? The things of this world will go strangely dim as you put your eyes on Jesus, I promise you. May we do this with new meaning as we partake of the emblems today. As Marcus, Pastor Mark is coming up, I want to ask if there's anybody here that has not received one of the, I can't believe I actually pulled this out of my pocket, uh, one of the cups 
with the wafer on the top. Did everybody get one? And if you did not, if you would raise your hand and one of our elders or deacons will make sure that you get one of these. Everybody get it? Um, there we go. Pastor Mark, Pastor Melanie, and myself, we were talking about how we have missed partaking of the Lord's Supper together for a long time. I think the last time we did it was January. A long, long time. Um, it is time for us to partake of the Lord's Supper together. I want to talk to those that are online. Uh, some of you came by the church this week and you picked up the bread and the wine. So you get to partake with us just the same as if you were here. So we want to let you know that you are welcome here with your church family, even though you were at home. Um, I feel like I've already said what I need to say about what this means. So, Pastor Mark, would you pray for the bread and wine as we, as we um, prepare to partake? Bow your heads with me, please. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. May the peace that surpasses all understanding come into your hearts. Father, we need your peace and we need to behold, open our eyes, open our hearts, so we may see the great love that you've given us, that you give to us on the cross and that you give us every single day that we believe in you. Please bless us, bless us today and let us take out the, the testimony, the word of our testimony to the world. And we thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for your Holy Spirit and thank you for your Sabbath today. Amen. You know, uh, Pastor... Pastor Mark, I'm uh, trying to open this. As everybody be, else is, I'm hearing the crinkling. Be careful. Yeah. Uh, be very careful when you open it. You're going to get the, probably you will open the juice first. <laughs> so be careful pulling that off because I could see how that will end up all over you if you don't. And then somehow, once that is opened, go back to the wafer. The wine first, and then thing. I need to get to the wafer. Well, the bread is first. Let's, let's do the bread first, but I got to get into it. Has anybody else found the trick? Oh, here it is. I see it. Yes. Okay. There we go. Did you, did you get it? Let me help my brother. Mine separated. It, uh, I thought so. Yeah, I'm looking for, oh, there it is. <laughs> I thought. Is everybody else having trouble? <laughs> right. What's up with that? It takes, it takes two tall guys to open a little package here. Come on, get one of the kids. They get kids, you want to come help us open up this one? <laughs> here, give me that. I'm not finding the spot. <laughs> There's two tabs, one on top of the other. Lead him through it, I'll get to it. All right, Mark's, Pastor Mark's gonna get to it, he said. I just happened to find the, the seal. <laughs> All right. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the cup together.
the Lord's Supper is not intended to be a dreary event. It points to our deliverance. It points to what Jesus did for us. So when we finish partaking of the Lord's Supper and we leave this place, we leave with great joy for what Jesus has done. We also know that as he told Peter, who said, wash my whole body, what did he say? No, the one who is clean only needs his feet washed. If you are by faith in Christ, in that relationship with him, you are already clean. What we're doing here is to provide that little remembrance of what Christ has already done for us to clean us up. And he wants to continue to clean your life up today. Amen. There's no better time in this earth's history as I look forward and the challenges that are happening today out in this world than to know that we serve a Savior who is alive and well. Let's, uh, let's close. I hadn't planned on this, but let's close with a hymn. Do you have a, your books in front of you? No. That's right. We took away the books. The power in the blood, okay, we can know that. Do you, uh, do you want to go to that? Power in the blood, Rochelle? Do you have the book there? Would you be? <laughs> I think most of us know the words at least to the first stanza, so we will, we will follow along with that. Two ninety four, all right. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, there's power in Jesus, your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily as praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Father in heaven, we live here knowing that we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. There is no reason to look back at our sins of the past. Those have been washed away. Lord, as we look forward, may we look at the opportunities to serve you and to share this wonderful message that we have, this good news of a risen Savior who lives to make intercession for us in the courts of heaven above. It is because of him that we can stand with confidence in these last days. Father, I thank you, and I pray God's your blessing upon each and every one that is here.
May the Spirit baptize each soul and fill them with a strength and power throughout this week to know that they are covered by the blood of the Lamb and that they have a work that you've given them to do to share that wonderful message of salvation to all they can. We thank you. We thank you for your love and your grace and what you have done for us. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a terrific Sabbath day.